that love God just like you do. Yes. Good. Preaching. Yes. Acts the 26th chapter. Stand with me real quick. Acts the 26th chapter. Paul is been put in chains and he's brought before Festus, who was a governor. And King Agrippa, the king of the territories there. They, 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 Paul's been in chains. He's going to Caesar to be judged. And, and uh, old Festus wants Agrippa to hear what Paul's got to say. He said, Agrippa's kind of his buddy. He said, look, I just want you to hear this man and see what he, he's got to say. He said, I heard him and, 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 and I think, you know, it's going to go either way. He could either be judged or he could get set free. But I, mean, I just want you to hear what he's got to say. So they call Paul, and Paul gets up, and as Paul does, he just starts defending himself. He just starts talking about Jesus and what God did on the road to Damascus and all these things that God's done and, and goes through history and starts telling them all this stuff. And right in the middle of it, in, in verse 24, uh, it starts like this. And, and thus as he made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art mad. Thy much learning doth, uh, doth make, uh, have turned to madness. But Paul saith unto him, I am not mad, most excellent Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Oh, for, yeah. king, for the king knoweth of these things unto whom I speak freely, I, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this has not been done in a court. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. You know what he was saying? He was saying, Festus, I'm not the only one. I'm not, hey, this isn't just me starting to try, try to start a club. I'm not the only one in this. I'm not the only one that believes this. Matter of fact, I'm speaking to a man that knows quite a bit about all of what I'm saying. Yep, yep. And then King Agrippa says this. Acts 26 and 27. King Agrippa, believeth thou the prophets, I know thou believest. And Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me Almost that persuades me to be a Christian. You understand something? Your life means something to God. The way you live your life means something to God. Oh, yes. Amen. We are weak when we're by ourselves, when we isolate ourselves, when we when we're, we're, we we can't learn to get along with one another and bind together. But when we get together, you realize this is not some little flash in the pan thing that's just going on. This is the church of the living God and the living God that I will have church. Let's pray, Jesus. Help me today, God, to bring this word that's on my heart. Help me, Lord, help this clay that I'm in. Touch it, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray for the hearers of this word. Help them to have faith, God, that's delivered in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. You may be seated. Just for a title, my title is God's Doing Something Big. Yep. Amen. Amen. You've got to understand something about God. Every once in a while, He likes to show off. So we call it conference, and, and they got they got all these little conferences. I think I've got Tanya Hook, maybe Beverly. Yes, you do. We got all these conferences where where people get together. We, we, it's the body of Christ getting together. Now, it, it, this isn't new in, in Acts, the 15th chapter. They had a first form of the church, and the, the whole church gathered together to talk about some stuff. That's what they do at general conferences. But there's there's so much more to it. When I was standing in that building, and I, and I looked around, and I saw all these different men, uh, one, of the, one of the preachers got up, and he's preaching. He says, I want all the senior pastors, the senior pastor, the pastor of the church, I want you to stand. Of course, I, I felt unworthy, but I went ahead and stood up. And just for a moment, I looked around. And my God, there are pastors everywhere. There was thousands of men standing that have churches just like this one. That have some that are 20 times as big and some that are the same size, maybe some that are smaller. But when you, you can't see, because we're not on a stage, we're not putting on a performance every every Sunday. It's not like the whole church gets up and we're on TV and every Sunday you see mobs of people getting the Holy Ghost. You don't because we don't do that. But friend, let me tell you something. 
it's happening. I watched a video. Uh, 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 a man showed me a video of the Philippines, and and in that video they had this little, it's kind of like what I was standing in. They had a little, uh, a little uh, uh, platform there, which was bigger than our church, and they had all singers and all this, and they're and they're leading in prayer. And all of a sudden, somebody starts playing a song, and this man starts singing. And, and you can see them with your eyes. Hundreds, thousands of people begin to run to the altar area. Some of them fall down on the ground and begin to worship. The, the estimated crowd, and this is from the Manila Police Department, they said there was over 100,000 people in that stadium on the ground and in the, in the stadium racks. It was a, foot, a soccer field. And, the, and, and they started singing and praising. And before long, that whole altar is just full of people going like this. Raising their hands and worshiping. And then, and then the man of God gets up and preaches. And then you can see like a wave of the Holy Ghost movement over all the people. You can see their hands going up. There's nobody up there orchestrating it. It's just the move of God. You can, you can literally see the Spirit of God moving across the audience. And, and over here they start to shout. It was like a wave. And they said 100,000 people got the Holy Ghost in that one service. <laughs> you see, just because it's not on TV or you don't hear about it on the news, don't mean God's not doing big things. Right. He's doing big things. Yes, My God's doing big things. Amen. Amen. They started testifying about all these different churches where that they're having a revival and God's moving. And I'm getting to a point here that I want you to hear. But they went to, I talked to a man in Slovakia. I was there with, with Mark and Anthony and, uh, and her brother, uh, Vladimir. And they have a, 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 a small church there in, uh, I forget the name of the city, but it's, uh, it's in Slovakia. And, and uh, I said, how long has that church been there? And he said, 108 years. I said, 108 years? He goes, yeah, it was started before Hitler took power in Germany. It was started before the communism started moving through Russia. A one God, apostolic, tongue-talking, church of Sahara church. There was a man that went to the Azusa Street Revival. Mm. He was Slovakian. Mm. And he got the Holy Ghost and they baptized him in Jesus' name. And he spent two years in America and he got on a ship and went back and took three months to get back to Slovakia, his home. And he started a church there. And before long, he had, he had grown it into a crowd of three or four hundred and they built a building. And then came the Iron Curtain. And they couldn't have church. Matter of fact, the government seized the building they had and, and turned it into a shoe sale shop. So they sold shoes there. But they didn't stop the church. It went underground. There was all these houses that it was in. But in 1990, when the, when the Iron Curtain fell, all of a sudden, communism was on the back back foot and they were they were reeling and all the Christians came out of the closet and then and this group of people that was started back early in the twenties came back and they went to the building and they took it back and when they went upstairs the pulpit was there all the all the all the pews were there all everything they needed for the church was still there it had been put in the attic and the, the communists never even knew it was there. They dusted it off, took it back downstairs, and a man of God got in the pulpit and preached in 1992, the first one God message in that town that had been preached for in 50 years. Amen. Just because you don't see God moving, don't mean God's not on the world. Yeah. 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 Just because you don't, you know, oh, I'm just over here mumping in my soup, and, and I'm just nobody, and we're just alone, we're just a small little church. I wish I could take every one of you to that conference, friend. You would realize, oh, we're not So bad, I, I couldn't even tell you. It, every time I turned around, I met somebody. I saw my uh, brother and sister uh, Thorson. Well, sister Thorson, their Thorson's past. And she came up and gave me a big hug. And her grandbabies that are now in their 20s were there and gave me a big hug. And I saw Mingo Guerrero, a friend of mine's brother that was there. I hadn't seen him in 35 years. He hugged my neck and took a picture with me. He goes, I remember you guys from years ago in Napa. We remember you too. When we were all young. <laughs> It was like no time to pass at all. Mm -hmm. You know what God was telling me? You're not in this alone. That's right. That's right. And nobody comes to church, it's okay. 
Because there's a big church. God's got a big church. It's moving. It's working. It's, it's doing something. There's life. There's movement. There's growth. It's living. It's moving. They had 16,500 chairs on Friday night. They were standing room only. Yeah. Yeah. Friday night, friend. I'm telling you what. Woo. Mama. We had five different preachers that preached. Woo. 15 minutes a piece. Let me tell you. The preachers are every one of them different than the other. But that last one was prophetic. He had all the men come up, all the preachers come up, and they started praying for us. And, and, and I had men I didn't know just weeping and praying on my shoulder and encouraging me and, and praying blessings on me and, 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 and saying, God's going to do work in your church and just give me a word. It was just like being inoculated. I just I just felt so good. And, and then they said, uh, that, that this is what they do. you got to be careful turning the kids on because they just don't come one. They said, let's have some young people. That's all they said. That's all they got out of his mouth. And here comes the crowd. And they mean they just plugged in every, every little slip, right? I had kids in front of me on my belly. I had kids in my back. I had kids under each arm. I mean, I was just slathering the kids. And there I got the hands all over me, praying for me. I was giving them a bug, probably. But we were, we were praying. And then that, that, that guy got on the piano. And he started hitting them keys. Next thing I know, that whole mass of elders mixed with all those young people. I'm talking about little itty bitty ones that were having their hands up right next to me. Praise and worship of God. I had one little boy, little black kid, grab my, arm, my jacket and said like, like this. And I said, what? You, you want to pray for me? I bet down there. Put a hand on him. <laughs> Take you home. <laughs> I know somebody about me. <laughs> they hit them chords, man. Let me tell you what. After my feet gave out, all I was doing was this. <laughs> and then when my knees gave out, I was doing this. And then when my arms gave out, I was doing this. That's <laughs> right, I was doing I got a video of that little lady right there. That's right. It works. That's right. Little, little Ronnie, I, I finally got tired and I went back to the, to the chair back there and Ronnie back there was clapping his hands and worshiping. And I said, Ronnie, you want to go to the front? He goes, yeah. And I grabbed little Ronnie's hand and we went up there and as soon as we got in the front, something hit that little boy and he was just going like this. Yeah. Little ten year old Ronnie, you know the whole thing. He just jumped in the shot and worked. And I couldn't stop. I started clapping. And I was clapping at the funeral and he got his camera and started videotaping. We were clapping and worshiping. After a while, I came back and I had blood all over my hands. I'm like, wow, I must have hit somebody. And I looked closer. I got all these cracks in my hand. I've been clapping my hands so long and so hard it started to bleed. And the cracks hit what am I telling you? God is doing something so big, so amazing, so powerful. He's not doing it just here in Pamela, South Carolina. God's busy all over the world. There's nowhere that God's not moving. And they said there's 219 countries and territories in the, in the world. And we're in 213 of them. I was like, my God. They had this. Now look, Pentecost is first class. These people, these people are not. I mean, you're not dealing with a bunch of novices here. So they had a lot of time to get good at what they do. My dad would love this. He would walk up to the end time little area. Was that not first class time? Ooh, <laughs> they have every. It was. It was beautiful. It was. It was first. I got pictures. She got video. We walked up there, and I was talking to that guy. And, Man, he was he was saying all these things, and I was like, man, I think they have to come preach for us. Friend, the Bible says in the last days there'll be a great falling away. Yeah. Come on. Jesus said, when I come, will I find faith? Yes, so he said. But there was a, 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 a I'll use the word dichotomy. There was a there was an opposite. Mm -hmm. Always remember when you think God's moving over here, you can't see it, but he's moving over here too. Right. Yeah, that's right. And what he was saying was those, those believers that their faith is weak, that they give up on living for God, they just, they just wash away. They just wash away. But the Bible says in the last days, there's going to be a latter rain where there's going to be a mighty outpouring. Yeah. So if some are giving up and thinking Pentecost, it's gone the way of the birds, it's just gone the way of the world. On the other hand, God's over here and he's pouring out the spirit upon all flesh. And there's a revival sweeping the planet. You know why? Because, friend, yeah. that old clock is ticking. Yes, that's the truth. That time is counting down. This man started just telling me a few things, and I was like, my God, you got my attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Friend, old, old Putin over there is saber rattling. Mm -hmm. 
but he did a little bit more. He sent one of, you, nobody here probably knows what a typhoon type class submarine is. Anybody know what a typhoon is? Double hole type, I knew you would know. It carries enough nuclear firepower. It's got like 19 or 20 missiles, but that's not the big deal. Each warhead has, has so many megaton uh, individual warheads in it. So the head of it has seven little warheads in it that are, that's what makes up the power because as it's going across, it can just drop each one of those in a different location. It literally, they call it the doomsday machine because it can literally wipe out life on the planet. One submarine. And Putin, the crazies over there on the last foot. There is things happening that we're just sitting here eating, drinking our sweet tea and slurping our slurpees and, and laying on the couch watching Netflix and God saying, wake up, my child. Right. Wake up, right. wake up. He's trying to shape the world. Wake up, there's some things happening. So so this is, this is what I'm here to tell you today. There's some big things if you just pay attention, if you just get out of this flesh. I was teaching the kids this morning about, about uh, modesty and living. It's not so much I care about how you dress and look. I want to know what's on the inside. Are you ready to meet Jesus today? If the clouds would split and God would blow that trumpet, are you ready to go? Friend, God's doing big things. We need to pay attention. When, when there, no, nobody I talk to, there, we have people from every country just now. I talked to all, Nigeria, all over Africa, there's revival. All over in China, there's a massive revival going on. They're saying tens of thousands of people are getting the Holy Ghost and getting saved every day in China. We just don't hear about it. Wow. There's a, in Manila, the whole Philippines is on fire right now. God's doing a great work everywhere. You know why? Because Jesus said, I will have a church. I will have a church. God's doing a big thing right now. And we've got to, we, friend, let's not just sit back and just come to church and partake and enjoy and say, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm having a good time. Friend, you need to get into the word of God. You need to dig out your prayer life and, and start digging the prayer. You need to get out your witnessing and start witnessing to some people and tell them, hey, there's a Jesus. He's a real living God. He created all things. And friend, he's coming back real soon. Amen. Let them call you crazy. Let them call you whatever they want to call you. But friends, I'm looking at the world clock, and it's up there just clicking. It's just clicking. And those hands are getting close to the hour. That's right. Mm. That's true. Sometimes we get so caught up in the little things, we're not looking at the big thing that God's doing. Oh, that's right. That's Sometimes right. you get so caught up in your day to day that you forget there's some big things God is doing. Amen. Amen. But you can win somebody to God, or God will send somebody else to win that. Let me tell you something. Never in the Bible do you ever hear. It, it, there's nothing about the harvest field. Nothing. Nothing. That wasn't the point. Jesus said, he said, lift up your eyes for the field is white under harvest. Yeah, yeah. The harvest field is all ready to go. It's there. The harvest is ready. He didn't say pray for a harvest anywhere. He said pray for the laborers. He never prayed. He didn't say pray for the harvest. It's there. He said pray for the laborers. I want to see people's lives change. I want to see people come out of sin that is destroying their soul. You say, uh, Brother Monroe, I just don't understand that concept of sin. Of course you don't because we're saturated in a sinful society. We're saturated. In it. It's hard to distinguish what's sin and what's not because there's so much of it. There's nowhere you can turn. I mean, I, I sat in, in the airport and eat my sandwich and, 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 and the, my entertainment was looking across to some poor young lady, I think. But she's so confused, she didn't know what she is. She got man pants on, man shirt on, man hair cut, man top. But she can't hide everything. Come on, come on, come on. I felt so sorry for her. Mm -hmm. That she didn't understand who, who, what God created her. Mm -hmm. A beautiful creature. Come on. Created by a loving God to have a full life, to experience wonderful things in life, yeah. to live and to, and to breathe and have understanding of what life is all about. But yet, because of sin, so confused that life is no longer enjoyable. It's just misery. Why? Because I don't know what truth is anymore. Because I'm so surrounded by sin. That's right. That's right. the truth. That's the truth. That's right. Friends, step back. Because that can get overwhelming. You got to step back. That's why these conferences are good to go to. They're good to go to. You know why? Play. I'm done. You know why they're so good? 
because you get a chance to stand there and see people, masses of people, not just old gray-haired farts like me, but young little, I saw five and six-year-old kids in a foot race trying to get to the altar. I seen teenagers that probably should be out there doing drugs and shooting dope. They started this, I ain't seen one in years. I, I thought, man, I need to join that, but I'm too big and clumsy. A couple of kids, they grabbed each other's shoulders and started this little train march. And Fred, oh my God, that thing wound for a half mile around that place. I said, I'll see that first guy anytime. I didn't see him for like 20 minutes. And all of a sudden, he starts charging this way. And Fred, everywhere, everywhere, they were just trying to get into that. They just wanted to get Why? Because God is moving. You, you say, I can't, I can't, I'm a Christian. I gotta be a bump on a deal pickle. There's nothing I can do. I can't enjoy life. Hot rock! Get out there and get you some, friend. I need to have you a place to get to the church and get some shoes on and get you some out of the air. Stay out and push your dog with it. Put me inside. Let me tell you something about them kids. There was kids that were so good looking, they hurt my eyes a little bit. On their Pentecost. Otherwise, they'd be in some magazine somewhere. I mean, they're just gorgeous. Tall, short, muscular, just, just, gosh, like our kids, just gorgeous. And they mask. That's right. And when they're dancing, they end up like jiggy, jiggy, jiggy. They're out there like getting, getting holy, but they're still holy. It was just, there was just a passion and a power and a movie of God's spirit and excitement. What were they excited about? They're excited about their living for God. And they understand they're free from sin. I don't have to be a drug addict. I don't have to be dope. I don't have to be praying at 15. I don't have to live in this world of sin. I don't have to do that. I can live for God. I can live a good life. I can be blessed of the Lord. I can involve myself in a church somewhere and help it grow and see people come out of the world. And I'm closing, closing, closing with this. I preach short so I can close twice. Nick Mahaney is the son of Charles Mahaney. Charles Mahaney was a man that was a drunk. <coughs> he was an alcoholic, a druggie. He said if, if, he, if he could put it in a, in a needle, he'd put it in his veins, and he did. He was just a drunk. He was, he was a terrible man by his own words. He said, uh, this man knocked on his door one day. I'm giving you Charles' testimony. I'm going to get the next one. Charles, the dad, he said, one day, this crazy man knocked on my door and said, you need to go to church with me. And so Nick had done, or Charles had nothing better to do, so he said, well, let's go to church. And he picked him up and took him to church. His first church service, he was so drunk he couldn't stand up. He had to sit down. The next service, he was, the next Sunday, uh, Brother Stanford, they got him around the first time when he got him. And he was drunk, he was in his room, he went into the house and shook him out of his bed, living with mom and dad, and, and cleaned him up, put him in, a, in, in some clothes and his hair got him in the car and he was drunk. And he sat there drunk. For seven years, Brother Sanford went and got Charles Mahaney out of bed, brought him to church, prayed him through, said, God, you can do anything. He was trying to build a church, had nobody, so he brought everybody he could find just to have somebody to preach to. For seven years, he did that. And one Sunday, he drove up to the house and went and knocked on the door and it sprang open and there was Charles Mahaney in a suit he had a haircut. His beard was shaved. His teeth were brushed. He had cologne on. He said, I'm ready to live for God. And that man went into the jailhouses of America and turned the jailhouses of America upside down for 30 years. I heard him preach. I'm shaking his hand. That man is pure fire. Loves. He passed away. But his son, Nick, got into church at 17. And somebody invited him to one party. And he said, I went. And he was gone. He went out in the world. And for 20 or 30 years, 20 years, he partied like the devil. Broke his mom and dad's heart. He, he was just a, a rebel. And he said, one day he called his dad up and he said, I think I'm ready to get out of this. His dad went and picked him up and got him clean. And, and he started preaching and, 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 and moving and, and helping people. This man, he had done everything, everything. And uh, his dad, 
got him, his dad died in 2007, but he, he came to his dad and, and uh, on his deathbed prayed, oh, I need a touch from my dad. His dad was unconscious. His dad sat up from being unconscious and looked at him and prayed for him. And, and he said that was when the transference of the anointing from my father came to me. Man, I'm pretty sure you have 15 minutes. Buddy. I'm telling you, everybody up there, that man went on the clock. And so he said, I have lived like the devil. And now I have raised my children. I think he has four kids. And not one of them lived for God. Not one of them. You know why? Because sin has that hold on people. It doesn't matter what the parents do. You'll make your own choices. And that was his point. That's right. But let me tell you something. I was up there worshiping with some kids that had tattoos and earrings. And they had, they had gang, gang signs on, on their other eyes. They had, there was girls up there with, with earrings and, and, and nose rings and all kind of stuff. They had, had tattoos on head and what, what, what are you saying, my girl? I'm saying this. In this day, in this hour, God's going to do a big thing. In order to do a big thing, he's got to kind of move some things out of the way so he can move everything in. Friend, when I saw this black guy, he had these ponytails, he had some dreads, but he was worshiping. He was speaking in tongues. The Holy Ghost was all over him. He had just come from the world. He said, hey, do you love this? He goes, brother. He said, I've done every drug under the sun. He said, there's nothing like this. That's right. That's right. 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 He let go of my hand. He just went to dance. And he kicked his head back. He looked at the lots and shake out the red beans. He was just oh, so on fire. Oh, so on fire. Wow! Because God is doing a big thing. Oh, and we got to just lift our eyes up past all this, all this stupid nonsense about this church and that church and that guy. I want to be part of God's big thing. Yes. I want to see God fill people with the Holy Ghost. I want to see lives change. I want to see people come in that are bound. That God breaks the chain of addiction. And now, now they got their life straight out. And God begins to add beautiful things to them. God can do it. Let's stand. I'm here to tell you, some of you need to start expecting some big things. Oh, I'm not worthy, brother. Who's worthy? Who's worthy? I want to know who's worthy. Who's worthy? Who's really worthy to live for God? Who's really worthy for the blessings of God? Who's really worthy for all the goodness of God? Who? I want to know who. Ain't me. I'm not. I'm a broken man. I'm a broken and sinful man. I've got I I've struggled for years with stuff. I, I'm just a man. I, I'm just flesh. But when I get into His presence, something sweeps over me. I feel love that I don't deserve. I feel mercy and peace. I feel grace. I I what? I, I I got all these things I don't deserve, and sometimes I feel like God's doing it for others, but He can't do it for me. You got a God that can do anything. A broken heart and broken road. I got a heart healer. God, a broken in my body. I got a body healer. I need more power. I got a God that's all power. What do you got? I got a big God that can handle anything you've got. Come on. I, I'm just, I'm not gonna beg. Let's ask you come on around this altar. You should have seen when they gave altar call. They didn't really give altar call. They didn't give altar call. It was just a name. Everybody just came for it. They just came. And they, we just all crowded around the front. And we started to sing. And as we sang and prayed, you can feel the release of the spirit. The power of God began to flow. And people began to petition God. I let my hands 